Hello, a very warm welcome from my side. I am Minu Hemati. I have the pleasure and indeed the honor of facilitating this year's Global Perspectives Conference, The Future of Civic Space. I'm a psychologist by background. I'm a specialist in multi-stakeholder processes, dialogues, and collaboration. And the center has asked me to support the designing of the agenda of the conference and to facilitate parts of it. I am German-Iranian, and I'm based here in Berlin. Enough about me. I would now like to ask our hosts to come up uh, and say a few words to open Global Perspectives 2016. And we start with Burkhard Gnerik, the co-founder and executive director of the International Civil Society Forum. Burkhard. Thank you very much, Okay. Thank you. So, great to be back. Uh, this is already the eighth conference uh, with uh, the name Global Perspectives. And uh, this is exciting, but also scary, because I never thought that I would be here for eight conferences, eight annual conferences. In fact, uh, the center is now getting close to uh, year 10 of its existence. So uh, it's a great event, but it's also one of a time uh, schedule, which I wonder where will that take us. So. Looking back at eight years, I would say we have made some progress, uh, but I would also say, well, the, the way ahead is much longer than the way we have already covered. And uh, it's fantastic to have the largest ever Global Perspectives Conference on the topic of the future of civic space. So the good news here is obviously loads of people uh, in our sector and in other sectors are seeing this as a crucial topic. Uh, so, uh, this is a good start to, to our conference. Uh, we have had a kind of pre-meeting, uh, which specifically brought together uh, different sectors to talk about how we can work better together, not only inside civil society, but with business, governments, media, um, fun, uh, founder, funders and others. Uh, so, I think we are already well on our way. Really looking forward to great uh, discussions over the next few days and hopefully a few aspects of an action plan. Not only how do we comfort each other in our situation, but how do we get together to become more powerful together. Uh, this is only possible, in fact, because the Böll Foundation is giving us this wonderful venue. And we had our first two global perspectives here and enjoyed it very much. Then we went out into the world as grown-ups too. And then we come back and we're really pleased uh, to have uh, the Böll Foundation hosting us once again. And uh, I'd like to welcome Barbara. Barbara Unmusik is the president of the Böll Foundation. <laughs> And she is a very dedicated defender of civic space. So we decided that I would do the general, hey, here we are, thank you for coming. And she would provide the content of what we're going to do here. So Barbara, it's a great honor and a great pleasure uh, that to be with uh, you here uh, in your wonderful place. So we're looking forward to hear what you have to tell us. Yeah, thank you very much, Burkhardt, uh, for gener generously sharing your time, so I have a bit more time to speak to you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear partners of Heinrich Böll Foundation, for me it's a very special honor to be welcoming you to this year's Global Perspectives Conference here in Berlin in the headquarters of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Thank you all for coming. I'm really delighted to have so many people around from such a diverse set of civil society actors from around the world are represented here. And I definitely already enjoyed so much the Civic Forum this morning. Um, and I really would like once more to thank the Civil Society Center for choosing the headquarters of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung again for this year's conference as we are together and we are passionate about regaining civic space and freedom. We have in common that we will all work to defend and promote the rights of people, that we raise our voices and that we support others who do. 
across the globe, active citizenship, active citizenship is under attack and the space of critical civil society is closing. Not just in countries with repressive or autocratic governments, but also in democracies. Governments increasingly fear for their privileges and their political power, since protests against arbitrary governance, corruption, environmental destruction and social inequality have increased over the last decades. Protests are on the rise in all regions and on all political contexts. People speak up and demand change, often as part of demonstrations, but also outside of the square. Us here at the conference are by and large representing and organized and on an institutionalized level. We are more or less representing the institutionalized civil society. What I would like to bring forward is we must reach out to all people who are taking a stand to claim their democratic rights. We are and we should form broader cross-sectoral alliances to reach beyond our own bubble. I think this was a crucial moment this morning when we made clear that we need that kind of cross-sectoral alliances and I just would like to reaffirm this. As another challenge, we must also engage, engage with new technologies. This was another issue of this morning's debate. On the one hand, the internet and social media allow civil, civ civic actors to connect, to communicate, and organize on a whole new scale. Local activists gain access to unprecedented international networks and attention to their grievances. On the other hand, online space is also increasingly becoming the arena for surveillance, control, and interference by government. They cut off our networks of communication and support. This is a dimension I would like to bring forward. We need to be much more aware of and extend our capabilities to support each other in dealing with the problems of cybersecurity. Another issue that was prominent in our discussions this morning was how government, governments justify draconian steps to pr protect their political power. Attacks on civil liberties and independent critical activity used to be justified or is used to be justified under security pretexts and anti-terrorism measures. These now compete, and we are all aware of this, with a reaffirmation of national sovereignty. I think we all together must find clear and decisive arguments to counter these narratives. We cannot let our fundamental human rights fall victim to security agendas. We have to defend those who are and representing the critical civil society. In light of the universal trend to close civic space, there are, enough, there are tough choices to be, to be made by all of us. What do we do in face of oppression and closing and shrinking spaces? Do we give in? Do we restrict our work to topics and agendas that don't get us into trouble? When faced with the dilemma of shutting down completely or not working anymore politically, what do we do? I cannot blame those who surrender to, to the extraordinary challenges they are facing. We, HBS, had to make the tough decision to close our office in Ethiopia and our work in Egypt and in other regions we are increasingly in a difficulty to decide what to do because definitely for our partners the, uh, the space is already closed and we are working with those who are dealing with democratic issues as well with environmental issues and we very much have to take into consideration that uh, on a broad level, environmentalists are heavily under attack, as bloggers are, as journalists are, as human rights defenders are. 
Let me now conclude by saying this. The global developments tell us that in future we will have to keep fighting to defend and regain our rights. Governments will try to divide us into good and bad guys to drive us apart. We cannot allow that to happen because ending solidar solidarity with each other only will weaken us. We need to stand in solidarity with each other and act together to reclaim our fundamental rights. Of course, we all need to make smart choices in our daily work on how to be most effective and most importantly, to be safe. But if we allow depoliticization and desolidarization to take over, we lose our legitimacy as actors of civil society. As NGOs and civil society organizations, we continue to be called upon in multilateral political processes such as the climate negotiations or the Agenda 2030 to be key watchdogs and drivers for the implementation of internationally agreed standards. I believe that we must use and fulfill this role as a watchdog and speak up, hold our governments accountable, spur political debate and also keep offering political and economic alternatives to the status quo. And we must also work politically to regain our space. This is all about reclaiming rights, human rights, civil rights. These are basic and unconditional rights. They are binding international law. They are common ethical standards. And we must keep reminding governments of that because they are all about to forget it, what international law means to them. The Civic Charta that will be launched here today is exactly about this. It is about reclaiming our right to freedom of expression, organization, and assembly, and to demand of governments that they uphold spaces where an independent and vibrant civil society can work without hindrance. I now want to invite all of us to use this conference, this space over the next few days as an opportunity to talk to and learn from each, to console and advise each other, to explore strategies for our work uh, in regaining space um, and the st to stand in solidarity with each other as civil society actors. I wish, us, us no, I wish all of us an interesting and rewarding couple of days of discussions and encounters and I very much again would like to thank you, the International Civil Society Center, to be with us and sharing our perspectives. Thank you very much and feel well here in our house. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't think we could feel even more welcome. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you, both of you, uh, for giving us some guidance and a lot of food for thought uh, and inspiration for the discussion ahead, and uh, also sharing your expectations and your hopes for this conference. So we'll take stock on Friday and see how far we got. Now, what's on the menu for Global Perspectives 2016, the future of civic space? You all have the agenda in front of you. Uh, it's in that one brochure that you received, and I'm not going to go through it in any detail. We have three main goals of the conference, three main desired outcomes. One is the deepening of our understanding of issues around civic space, sharing data and research and experiences with shrinking space and exchange of concrete things that are happening. Two, sharing knowledge about shifting space, sharing experiences and ideas about what we can do to defend, promote and further develop our space. And three, as I think uh, it's been said several times already, in moving to action, strengthening, extending, expanding existing initiatives and alliances, building new alliances, finding new partners. So we try to develop the agenda with these goals in mind and have created a number of sessions and elements to help you reach those goals. 
So we will hear keynote speeches and presentations, sharing research, overview, and analysis, and sharing experiences with shrinking space from around the world, sharing ideas on what to do about it, presenting experiences with different strategies, and challenging us with new ideas. We will have panel discussions for presenting and discussing knowledge and experiences. And most of the time, you will have the opportunity to directly interact with the speakers, and we do Q&A here in the plenary. We also have three breakout sessions with a total of 17 parallel workshops covering a range of important topics, two time slots tomorrow and one slot on Friday. Many of you are directly involved in putting together and contributing to breakout sessions. Um, and again, they are focusing on deepening our knowledge uh, about shrinking space, on deepening our knowledge and understanding of strategies, and on moving to action together. By the way, two of those 17 workshops are for you to design and use as you see fit on the spot. One is during the breakout session two tomorrow. Uh, it's called the Alliance Building Session. Uh, and we, you can use it, uh, continuing conversations that you started in the networking session just before. So there's space for you to do that, and there would be facilitation if you so wish. We also have an open space session uh, on Friday morning during breakout session number three. Uh, where you can suggest uh, topics or issues for discussion as you feel are important right there and then, and find people who feel the same and who want to have a discussion about it. So both these uh, sessions are meant as over an hour long opportunities to bring up something that is coming uh, anew to your minds here and find people who are interested in it. So initiating new alliances they, for that, they would also be very good spots in the program. We have more networking tools and helpers. Uh, there's the networking wall outside, and I think many of you already have your picture up there. If not, please use the opportunity during the break uh, to pin yourself where you feel you belong so that people can find you easily. Many of you know each other, but many of you are also new, so we wanted to facilitate getting everybody into the community uh, in that way. In your conference brochure, you also find Oh, I don't have it with me. Thanks, Tom. You find this one. Um, you were given one of those. Um, we call them the networking and alliance building cards. If you come up with a shorter name, uh, please let me know. These are meant for you uh, if you have an initiative or partnership, an alliance that you are engaged in and you want it to expand and to grow. Um, you can write it down here. Pin it on the networking wall next to your picture so people know this is what you're interested in. Likewise, if you have a completely new idea, if it's today or tomorrow or on Friday, do the same thing. Write it down in brief words and pin it next to your picture so people can find you and talk to you about it. We will also use this tomorrow afternoon in the networking session. It will all become much clearer then. Main thing is, don't be shy to use this and put down what you're interested in, finding partners, finding uh, interested, interested collaborators for. So you can use this card, and if you do need to, we can give you another one. On Friday after lunch, we want to share and present networks, alliances, ideas, and initiatives that have been strengthened or that have been created here. Even if they're just a beginning, we have part of the closing session reserved for this, and we feel it's very important to bring this to everybody so that we can see what is developing, but also take the opportunity to then take part. So if there are things that are budding here or things that are growing, do let us know so that we can collect it for Friday midday. More, we also have an exhibition, as you have seen outside at the back wall. When you see this, you can explore the world of Gado one of the most celebrated satirical cartoonists in East and Central Africa. And I'm wondering if he's in the room. Gado, are you here? No, not yet. He might do a guided tour uh, through these cartoons for you tomorrow midday, and I'll let you know then. I don't know quite yet. We do also want to do video interviews with you. We want you to share your thoughts and experiences on changing civic space. We'll be collecting short interviews uh, with our speakers and with other guests. Look out for the women with the cameras, and I believe it's mostly going to be Alexia. There she is. She, you look out for her. She's also the one who takes the best uh, photos for the networking wall, I think. 
um, and make an appointment with her if you are prepared to do a little video interview. Finally, we have breaks, breaks, and breaks. We have coffees, lunches, and dinners. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> All meant to create time and space for you to meet, discuss, develop ideas, listen to each other, enjoy appreciation, and enjoy the relaxation among colleagues and friends that you are here. Overall, Global Perspectives 2016 will go through three phases, exchange of knowledge, experience and ideas, turning to action, and then presenting the results. It's not entirely in position, but roughly uh, the phases of the conference. So that Friday midday, we can look and celebrate, hopefully. Apart from all that, there is one more and overarching goal, and that is energizing, supporting, and motivating you all so that you go away from this conference maybe a little tired because it was a full program, but also full of ideas and inspirations and with new partners and new allies that you can work with in the future. Conferences are about conversations, and I'm sure you all came here with lots that you want to share, experience and knowledge and ideas you want to share with your colleagues. In my experience, working with many passionate and motivated groups around the world, I've seen how much you can all bring to conferences and workshops and meetings. Sometimes this richness and passion can make it difficult for us to listen, to take in all that the others have to share. But it's great if we do. If we listen to each other and we listen deeply and listen without thinking about what me may, what me may want to say next, we have new thoughts and new ideas. We can truly learn from each other and learn together. It was Bill Isaacs who called his book Dialogue, or The Art of Thinking Together. Very well put. So we hope that you have plenty of opportunity for thinking together at Global Perspectives 2016. One last thing is the hashtags and the Twitter list that you've already seen out there. Uh, details about that are in the brochure. And for now, I would say mobile's off or on silent if you haven't done so. And if we do hear a fire alarm, it is not an exercise. We have asked, so if we do hear the alarm, we do leave the building. We'll be good boys and girls and leave the building. And lastly, we do have a live stream going on this afternoon for this session. So you can enjoy this uh, on the website after the conference and let people know that this is being streamed. I think with that, enough of looking to the, at the menu and getting to the buffet. I am very pleased to welcome our first keynote speaker, Thomas Carruthers, the Vice President of Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, a well-known researcher on issues around democracy and participation. He's going to talk about the state of, civic, of space, civic participation, worldwide. Tom will talk for about 20 minutes and then we take comments and questions from you. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, I want to thank the International Civil Society Center and the Heinrich Boll Stiftung for the invitation to be here today. It's really a pleasure and an honor. I've been given the assignment of trying to provide an initial overview of the topic that is, that's before us today. And I think I've been asked to do so in a way that's relatively broad and cross-cutting without being superficial. And above all, as realistic without being depressing. <laughs> it's nothing worse than an opening speaker who's essentially a cold shower in a workshop. Yet at the same time, those who know me know I'm also not one to uh, treat a topic in a superficial way and, and give out, in a sense, uh, superficial hopes. This is difficult, what we're facing. So what I'd like to do is focus on some elements of the phenomenon itself, both some sort of dimensions of it that I'd like to emphasize, and I'd also like to talk about the causes I'm going to leave the topic of responses, in a sense, to all of you and all of us, in a way. That's what we're here for. So I'm trying to provide a framing, if you will, of the problem. <clears throat> now, about the topic itself, unfortunately, with a group like this, I really don't need to say that there's a phenomenon of shrinking space going on in the world. Some audiences I speak to, I do need to describe it, because they're not aware, but you are. 
and you know about the range of formal and informal measures that governments and other power holders are carrying out uh, to shrink space, about the, so the very wide <coughs> sort of extent of the phenomenon in terms of the number of countries, the type of regimes, and so forth. So what I'd like to do is just emphasize several features of it that are really upon us today, and then turn to the causes which I feel are actually deep and need some careful thinking. A couple of the dimensions that need to be highlighted are first the remarkable speed of this phenomenon. It's actually just two years ago, <clears throat> I wrote a report uh, on closing space with a colleague, Saskia Breckenmacher, and at the time we published it, Actually, the topic hadn't been framed that much. There were some other good work by Civicus and others on the topic, but it really hadn't been framed very much, and the report was used in many quarters just as a way to introduce people to the topic. And I got out the report in preparation for this. It's only two years old, but it almost feels, not ancient history, but like a long time ago. There's a lot of water under the bridge just in the last two years. This topic has come on extremely fast in international circles, and it's a a sign of, we all live, you know, we're living through a time of tremendously rapid change in international policy as well as domestic policy and other things. This topic very much embodies that. It's a viral phenomenon in a way, both psychologically and in real terms, and we're experiencing that day to day. It's the first thing I'd like to highlight. <clears throat> Second, it's going very deep in some countries. Uh, let me just take one example, <clears throat> Egypt. Egypt is a country which has been engaged obviously in repression for, unfortunately, for decades, but in the last five years in a process of striking against civil society actors. And the Egyptian government and governments, in a sense, because there have been successive governments since 2011, have been relentless in just continuing to shrink space to go to the very heart of the civil society community in Egypt and to try to destroy people, organizations, livelihoods, families. It's, it's really punishing. We have Bahay uh, with us today who will talk more about this. But if you go into any one country where this is going on, the relentlessness of certain power holders to go after this is just stunning. And I think we have to be aware of that. And it's, it's very, very sobering. Turkey is another example. Turkey is experiencing a kind of intimidation <coughs> throughout intellectual and civic life, uh, particularly since the attempted coup of July, but over the last, unfortunately, 10 years that again is contrary to what we thought was the direction of Turkish history in the 1990s and 2000s, and seems to have no limit. The government just keeps not stopping at breaking points at which we would hope it might stop and pause and think about the implications of what it's doing. Instead, governments are just going all the way to the bottom. Uh, <clears throat> a third phenomenon, or dimension of this phenomenon, is that we started in a way, <clears throat> I think, five, seven, nine years ago as we began to see the tide of events, thinking of this somewhat in relatively narrow terms as about human rights defenders. But unfortunately, we've had to continue to broaden our scope again and again. Environmental activists today, for example, are coming under tremendous pressure in a number of countries. Investigative journalists who do anti-corruption work are being persecuted, murdered uh, in a disturbing number of countries. People working on migrants, <coughs> migrant rights, refugee rights are being targeted in some countries as agents of sinister influence, and so on. The agenda of the shrinking space, the negative agenda, if you will, of power holders, again, is remarkable for the breadth and the tendency to add in issue after issue. Another dimension of it is <coughs> the fact that closing space is going across borders. <coughs> this I mean in two different ways. Governments are finding new ways to go after activists who leave the country and are operating, or just living, in, in countries outside the country in question are going after them. They're targeting them in different ways, uh, through cyber attacks of different types, through personal intimidation, through targeting of family members. I could name many governments, <clears throat> unfortunately the Chinese government, the Turkish government, the Egyptian government, and quite a few others. Uh, are going after people across borders, and the idea that closing space is something that happens within problematic countries has been lost. This is, a, this is a phenomenon that's reaching across borders. It's also reaching across borders in another new way that's really disturbing. <clears throat> Governments are not simply going after activists within their own country and going after funding organizations or support organizations that are operating in their country. They're going after them internationally as well. A vivid example has been, we might hear about it tomorrow when Chris Stone speaks, is the attack of the Russian government on the Open Society Foundations. The Russian government has stolen over 2,000 documents off of OSF platforms, created a website called DC Leaks, published all of those documents or 
I've downloaded all of those documents onto that website and is using that as a campaign to intimidate, <coughs> discredit, and sort of harass open society foundations wherever it's working. So the Russian government is going on the offense of reaching outside of Russia and getting striking right at the headquarters of an organization uh, based on another continent and trying to hurt it and, and in a way striking very hard against it. And that's just the start. <coughs> uh, they, you know, we know what's happening with cybersecurity in all sorts of dimensions, but when we see this tool being used by a government as part of its shrinking space agenda, that should give us pause <clears throat> to think about this as something that goes on within countries. This is something that goes on globally. So that's four dimensions <clears throat> that are troubling. Now, but there is, there is good news as well. We see, for example, and even in societies like Egypt <clears throat> that are really under attack in terms of civic space, we see activists, ordinary citizens adapting and in creative and very re resilient ways to try to find space. In Egypt, you see a lot of informal activity. Thought has not closed in Egyptian society. Organizations are being closed, but the mental space that Egyptians have tried to occupy, particularly since 2011, is not fully closed, is not dead. People are working more informally. They're working online in certain ways. They're working in very localistic groups offline. They're finding ways to adapt and do that. And we need to do a lot more work to understand processes of adaptation that are occurring in a number of different countries. That's just one example. Ethiopia, of course, is another example of a country which has experienced, Barbara mentioned, closing space for a number of years, but just in recent weeks or months, we've seen surprising, some way a surprising and unexpected pushback by a number of groups and people in Ethiopia who are saying, you know, we've had enough here. You can't just keep doing this, no matter what your developmental successes in certain domains. And we're also seeing, just as we're seeing negative learning across borders among power holders who learn from each other in negative ways, obviously we're seeing positive learning across borders as well. And there are countless examples. I mean, just one example in Honduras, for example, we see activists there learning <clears throat> very skillfully from the Guatemalan experience of anti-corruption activism, trying to apply the experience in Guatemala that's been learned there. So there is positive learning across borders uh, as well that matches the negative learning. Now let's talk about causes, because <clears throat> I think it's very important at the start of a workshop like this to try to drill down and think hard about why this is happening. Now, <clears throat> when I first began analyzing and talking about the subject, I tried to push people not to ascribe the causes just to a number of sort of bad apple leaders. There was a tendency about 10 years ago as people began to see this phenomenon emerge to think, well, if we didn't have certain presidents out there, I won't name them, but they're known to you, um, certain presidents out there in the world who are particularly difficult on this subject, it'll probably just go away. And instead, a different explanation began to emerge, which I think is powerful, but as I'll mention in a minute, I think is also inadequate. But one that I tried to emphasize in others, which is that we really need to see this phenomenon <clears throat> as a result of a tremendous clash between two of the fundamental imperatives of the 21st century. The first imperative is a positive one, is the imperative of greater civic engagement, participation, and the simple drive for accountability of citizens who want power holders to be accountable to them and to deliver what they're supposed to do. This is a powerful trend in human history, which is driven by structural factors. It's driven by the opening up of democratization over the last 30 years, which created a tremendous amount of political space it has to also do to socioeconomic transformations that have come from the reduction of poverty in many countries. Bad though the news is on the international economic front in many ways, we can't lose sight of the fact there's been a tremendous reduction in poverty in a number of countries, which has led to the emergence of people with more socioeconomic foundation to be active. And of course, technology has also been a driver of greater <coughs> ability to be empowered and active and participatory. And so you have on the one hand these powerful structural drivers which have been pushing the first couple of decades, of, or the first decade and a half of the 21st century to be a time in which the defining political challenge or the defining political moment is whether citizens can achieve responsiveness from power holders. And the closing space phenomenon to me is the effort <coughs> of power holders to put this toothpaste back in the tube, if you will, to put this genie back in the bottle and to say, we don't want balanced state society relations. We don't want an active, energized society. We have an old-fashioned conception of state society relations where the state has all the power. And so in a sense, I first saw the civil society phenomenon, which I think it is to some extent, <clears throat> as this fundamental battle over the destiny of, in a sense, political life in the 21st century. Is it going to be a century 
of open societies or a century, a, a century of closed societies. So I think, in a way, that's one fundamental causal dynamic that we should be aware of. But there's another, which has only really emerged in the last couple of years, that's sharply enough that we can, we can see it now, which is also a transformation of politics. <clears throat> and unfortunately, this is, just in the last year, has almost become common wisdom, even though five years ago we were only starting to talk about it. By transformation of politics, <clears throat> I mean the rise of forms of politics. Populism is an easy word. It has, it's a confusing word and is used and misused, but politics in which you go away from old left-right or identity divisions and you try to define politics as the mass or the people against an elite and strongman leaders emerge who claim to represent the national will, the people against an elite. And they use political techniques of mobilization and demonization and so forth to try to describe a political division in this society between the mass and the elite. And we see this phenomenon, of course we focused it on in a few cases, uh, that are quite striking, like Hungary, for example, which within the European Union has had a populist leader doing this within the country. But we look around. Russian politics have been defined by a kind of populism. Indian politics in the last couple of years have had some significant populist tendencies. The Chinese president in the last several years has redefined the style of leadership in China in a much more personalistic, much more populist way. Look at what the president of the Philippines is doing these days, classic sort of populist mobilization of an almost bizarre type, in certain ways sort of certain so, sort of socio-psychological characteristics that are a bit puzzling. Turkey, Erdogan is again just a classic figure of mobilizing, trying to mobilize the national will against various elites that he's trying to strike against. Now this form of politics feeds the shrinking space problem in two important ways. First, Civil society in this conception of politics gets moved from being the representation of people to being the representation of elites. We thought, you know, we're all in this business because we thought we're sort of on the side of people's interests. We're trying to help the representation of interests and articulation of interests in societies. But these kinds of political leaders and ways of thinking about politics push civil society into the elite mold and say, ah, oh, these are dangerous elites, cosmopolitan elites, who will go against our narrative of national values, our narrative of conservative values, and look at what they're doing on women. And Erdogan says, you know, women are genetically different and just to have three kids and stay home. They have a conservative narrative about <coughs> values that civil society represents, and they're very clever and able to position civil society not as representing the interests of the people, but representing the interests of a discredited elite. And secondly, the populist approach to politics also strikes against the international supporters of civil society and says, uh-huh, and these, you know, these elites over here who claim to be civil society, who are their real friends? Uh-huh, it's these international actors, and the populist narrative is usually xenophobic, it's nationalistic, it's demonizing of international actors, and so this fits nicely into their narrative as well. It gives them a popular enemy who they can demonize. And we look around at the amount of conspiratorial thinking about international action in the last five to seven years. It's really reached you know, psychotic proportions in a number of countries. When you read the descriptions of what international actors are doing, you're mystified as to whether this can be serious. But you see the power of these narratives and how effectively they're being used in many places. And so the transformation of politics, which unfortunately just in the last year or two we've come to see as a broader anti-globalization, nationalistic, a closing of borders, rising of xenophobia, this general political phenomenon very much contains within it a powerful driver of shrinking space. This view of the causes <clears throat> of realizing that it's both about the central tension in early 21st century between the imperative of accountability, participation, engagement, and the closing imperative, but also about the transformation of politics uh, means that we're in deep and dark waters here on shrinking space. We're in complex waters. And that has both sort of, that has both bad news and good news uh, <clears throat> implicit in it. The bad news is these are dark and deep waters, and any idea that a bit of mobilization to try to improve a few NGO laws is going to turn the tide. We're in waters here that are very deep, that are you know, profound drivers of how societies are evolving. So we've got to be ready for something that's much longer and much deeper as an action against this. But the good news isn't properly paid enough attention to yet, which is the good news is once we understand 
the shrinking space phenomenon as being contained within these larger drivers. In a sense, we realize that we as a community, the people who are sort of on the front lines of civil society work and care about the shrinking space issue very immediately, we're not alone in the sense that <clears throat> We're not alone within, the own, within our own sort of policy communities. There's been a tendency of human rights defenders and civil society supporters often to feel their own diplomats or their own business people or their own sort of policy communities don't always understand them, don't always appreciate them enough and see them too much as a specialized cause. But when we can go to those policymakers and defense officials and treasury officials and others and say, you know, you're having problems with Turkey as a security partner because they're acting erratically. They suddenly have very uncertain relations with both the EU and the United States. It's tied to the shrinking space problem. It's one and the same problem. We're not just some specialized community that happens to care about these sort of organizations. We're onto something profound. We are dealing with the very driver of the issues that are causing you, the security community, the finance community, the business community, and other communities that are causing the problems. And so we have a much wider range of allies <coughs> in this struggle if we can properly define what we're doing and help people understand that the shrinking space is not a sector, it's not a sort of a small scale issue affecting a specialized group of organizations. It is the heart of the struggle that, in a sense, the Western liberal set of values that Barbara talked about is struggling with around the world in a very broad and deep way. <clears throat> so there's good news, but it's challenging news because it requires us in a sense to start in gatherings like this, organize our thinking, mobilize our collective action, but then figure out how we reach out more broadly within our policy communities to explain what we're doing, explain what the problem is, and help people see the connection to all of the other agendas that international actors are trying to pursue for a more peaceful and cooperative world. I hope that perspective, this perspective of seeing the deeper causes, the relationship to these issues, can help our community overcome some of the natural divisions that have slowed an effective response. These are divisions that are familiar to us. I, I see them all the time in meetings I go to and people I talk to. You know, divisions like between, even within organizations that support democracy, those that are a bit more forward-leaning and tend to want to be rather confrontational and those that would like to be very soft and quiet. And sometimes even within the democracy community, there are serious differences. Then there are also differences between the more political side of assistance and the more developmental, with some developmentalists saying, if it weren't for you political assistance people, we wouldn't be having all these problems until it turns out that child welfare in a particular country is a sore spot as well. So that's been another form of division. And there have been divisions between um, as I mentioned, diplomats and aid providers with diplomats saying, you know, we have serious security issues here. We have to put you guys to the side, and that's caused divisions. So seeing the agenda in broader terms, I think, will be the start of helping us overcome those, these divisions and move to a more common platform and a deeper and more effective response. So I hope these perspectives, both understanding some of the key dimensions of this phenomenon, the speed of the phenomenon, the depth of it, the extent of it, its reach across borders, and then to look at the causes and realize it's both about the central tension of closed versus open, but also a new form of politics which is driving a kind of thinking about nationalism and globalization that is, that is at the heart of this as well, will help us, as I say, recognize the bad news and the good news and start to overcome some of the divisions that have limited our responses to date. Hope this has been useful to you. Look forward to comments and questions. And once again, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Thank you very, thank you very much, Tom. We have about 15 minutes for comments and questions. And the 15 minutes may sound long, but we might want to take a number. Um, if people have questions or comments to Tom's Lots of food for thought. There's one over there. Briefly say your name and your comment. Yeah. My name is Caroline Tevin. Thank you so much for this very interesting introduction. I have a question, um, and it's about that you described that um, by viewing whatever is happening in those all these different countries actually has sort of more common causes, and that therefore we can overcome certain natural divisions. My question is. Um, 
doesn't that take away actually really understanding what's going on in very particular contexts? Because I can imagine if farmers or indigenous communities are fighting against infrastructural projects, um, having alliances with businesses or trying to understand it in similar ways as like the more global um, shrinking space going on in Turkey or in Egypt, is that really helpful? You want to take a few? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you very much, Jeremy Hobbs from Action Aid. I just wondered if you could speak really to follow that question a bit more about the politics behind this and the vested interests. I mean, in Australia, there are environmental organisations that are being put under the hammer by a, a government that's been captured by coal interests. And I just think we need to understand where the money is driving the politics. And sometimes one can can be forgiven for thinking that it's kind of copycat behaviour. But I, I'm wondering whether it's, it's actually not a bit more fundamental and structural than that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shall we take one yeah. more and then go one round? Um, I think so. You had your hand up and there's the microphone with you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Paulo Kumu from the Africa Platform. Yes, I, I will post you three questions. Uh, you did mention about the two fundamental transformations going on. And when I listen to it, it appears to be what is happening within society. Uh, and my question is, do you notice any fundamental transformation going on within civil society? that actually acknowledges that in fact there are changes going on in, in society that necessitates that we need to change. Uh, the second question I want to ask is again related to that. Do we as civil society have the right tools to challenge and to fight what seems to be emerging which seems to be much, much bigger than us? Because when I look at even how we have organized this meeting, we still are fighting with the same, same old tools of the enemy. We still want the laws to change, and we still want policies to change, and I'm just wondering whether we need to reorganize the tools we use for us to address the new uh, challenge that is facing us. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Barbara, you also want to come in and then Thomas? Yeah, will just uh, briefly. Uh, Thomas, I know that you uh, talk to governments, um, those ones who call themselves demo democracies. I would like to get to know, can you give us a brief overview? What do you think uh, our Western, so-called Western governments uh, react on the issue? Do you have experience if they react at all and how? And where are the limitations? Is it worthwhile to adv to do advocacy work? Well, okay. Okay. Well. Okay. <laughs> Some yeah. easy questions for yeah. you, Tom. Okay, well, that's a lot. Um, <laughs> thanks. I appreciate those are wonderful questions. The national specificity versus the, the cross-cutting causes, uh, I think, you know, the two need to inform each other. I guess I'm emphasizing the cross-cutting causes, but I assume we need in any particular national context to go deep into understanding the particular drivers. But I think it is helpful when you're working in a particular national context to see the relationship between other phenomena. So, for example, activists in the Philippines suddenly facing a very unexpected sort of turn of events due to a president who's just trying to drive the country down a particular road. It's, it's, it's very much about him and his own personal background and Philippine, the tradition of the Philippines, its relationship with certain other powers. Yet the tools that he's using, the kind of style of... of the way he's using the platform of the presidency to mobilize certain groups is very familiar and lessons can be learned about how others have done that and what kind of narratives counter that and what sort of techniques. So you want the best of both worlds. Of course, you've got to go deep into the national context, but you can't lose sight of the fact that there are lessons to be de derived from both. With, so I really think it's, it's crucial to bring the two together. And I was emphasizing the global or the cross-cutting because I think it's, it's sort of a given, but we've often started with just the national picture but it's important to bring them together. Jeremy, thanks very much for your comment. I purposely use the term power holder rather than politicians, because a lot of the power in the world is not held by politicians. For better or for worse, it's held by business interests, it's held by financial interests, it's held by informal groups, military you know, security structures that are outside formal politics and so forth. And so you're right. I mean, there's a not exactly a fragmentation, but there is a diffusion of power in many countries and interlocking networks among formal and informal sources of power. Of course, it's gone on, but it's globalization has fueled it in certain ways and given them new tools. 
international economic sort of life of the last 20 years has encouraged certain forms of concentration of power and so forth. So you're right. I think in a way what we're seeing is the, the shrinking space phenomenon is also about the changing nature of power and how power is trying to maintain itself in resistance to advocacy, accountability, anti-corruption, and so forth. It feels threatened by those things and strikes back, whether it's at an environmental group, an investigative journalist, an advocacy group over here, and is trying to protect itself in different ways. So I very much agree with, I think, the thrust of what you're <coughs> saying. It's a very <clears throat> deep and, in a sense, a rich question is, is civil society changing in parallel or in response to the situation? I think, in a way, we'll talk about that over the, the next couple of days. <clears throat> I think it is, you know, and I think it was already changing. I think there was a generation of civil society activism that kind of emerged in the early 1990s that had a kind of a natural life of 15 to 20 years. It was actually a generation of people in many cases. Uh, a generation of organizations that were formed, often with certain kinds of international partnerships. I, you know, I guess I was part of, you know, both studying and being part of some of those waves. I think it was a, an important and a lot of advances were made. But it is in a period of self-questioning, above all, about <clears throat> its sense of its relationship to its own societies. And the attacks on its credibility and legitimacy have stung in many countries and have, have hurt in a way and have caused these organizations to question their own relationship. Uh, their relationship to their own society. And secondly, it's, it's hit on the question of methodology and sort of effectiveness of, in a sense, the, the advocacy approach or the, if you will, I mean, it's caricaturing a bit, but the technocratic advocacy approach focused on policy change based on sort of, you know, input into policy processes as opposed to mobilization or other kinds of techniques. So you're right, civil society is undergoing, I think, both a generational shift that's almost natural given the way cycles of change work, uh, but also those two imperatives about legitimacy and credibility on the one hand of effectiveness are pushing civic activists to think of new ways or to find new ways. And I think it's happening. We're at Carnegie carrying out a small research project called the New Civic Activism Network that's looking at new forms of civic activism around the world in different countries. We have specialists in a number of countries around the world. That's one of a number of such studies. The Bullstifting has also done important work in this area, as have many other researchers. And we're, you know, often just coming to grips. Like I say, in a case like Egypt, you know, it's hard. It's very decentralized. It's often young people who don't really want to have relations with the tri traditional, quote, civil society organizations, have their own ways of doing things, more fluid, less formal, um, different definition of what are issues, fluid agendas, and so forth. And so it's, it's often hard to get a grip on what's really happening within any one country, let alone as a broader phenomenon. But I think it's happening, in a sense, in parallel with the shrinking space issue. Thank you very much. Guys, if you're that disciplined, we can take another round of questions. You didn't answer oh, sorry, Barbara's didn't answer question. Barbara. Sorry, Barbara. Oh, okay. <laughs> Working with government. Yeah, I was trying to avoid that one. It's touchy. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, I think it's worth trying to work with governments. Um, I mean, they talk about a government I know somewhat, which is the U.S. government. <clears throat> the U.S. government has many different interests in any one country in which it's working, whether it's Egypt or Turkey or China or wherever. <clears throat> and so there are divided interests and, you know, often different interests pulling against each other. But <clears throat> the issue of civic space has come to be understood within the US government as something that's connected to a lot of other issues. It started to some extent, as I described, as something of a specialized issue in which human rights activists and others would come and say, please pay attention and help us, we're having trouble. But it, it quickly moved out to something troubling is going on. Shannon Green is here. She worked in the White House and was one of the people who helped sort of broaden the approach within the US government on this. And you now see at least a consciousness of the need to integrate some thinking about, <clears throat> you know, if we're going to, civil society organizations come to, quote, us, the US government, and ask for our help to realize that that's not just some special pleading by a narrow set of organizations, but ties to other fundamental goals. Now, it hasn't worked very well in some places because of the cross-cutting interests. Egypt has been a frustrating case where the drive for stability on the part of Western governments looking for stability, quote, in the Arab world or stability in other parts of the world, the counterterrorism imperative, I hardly need to tell you, these things do cut against it. But there is, I think, you know, a greater appreciation going on that this is something that isn't just a superficial level, as I said, is connected to these other interests. I, I published a piece a couple of weeks ago on closing space and fragility, trying to encourage policymakers to realize that their concern over state fragility 
is one and should be one and the same with their concern about closing space and the sort of hard security issues that are raised by fragility and instability in places uh, are very much connected to closing space. And so if a country like Uzbekistan closes space and excludes certain kinds of uh, ethnicities or religious actors within the country, they could have trouble over time. Egypt, I mentioned as a case also in the article of a country that's maybe setting the preconditions for a kind of deeper instability in the society as a result of closing space. So I think there is starting to be a joining up of the agenda, but <clears throat> we as a community have to help that process happen. Okay. Thank you. Um, given the time, I've, I have four or five speakers on medicine. We're just going to take two and see how far we get, and then take it. So the gentleman over here and the lady over there. Okay. Tarek Abalim is my name. I am come orig uh, originally from Egypt, <laughs> and uh, I agree with you about uh, the some countries you have mentioned. But uh, we have the feeling in Egypt about the civil society that all of this shrinking the civil society space is according to the green light from USA. And also the anti-terror regulation becoming from USA. And I think a lot of people thinking when we wanted to start, we have to start with USA and also with the Western country. What do you think about it? Okay. And one more. Um, we can have the microphone over here. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, hi, my name is Karenina from Accountable Now, um, and thank you very much for broadening our thinking around the root causes here, and I particularly appreciated that you didn't want to leave us depressed at the end. <laughs> but then I felt you rushed a little bit around the opportunities that are actually out there. <laughs> so, sort of concrete <laughs> examples or indeed suggestions that you see where you would say addressing the root causes would be doing more than just a little mobilization, as you said. Thank you. Thanks. Let's take those two, and I think okay. we might be up yeah. on time. Mm -hmm. Look, I appreciate <clears throat> what you're saying on, on Egypt. The United States has had, over the last 50 years on balance, the United States has not been a pro-democratic actor in Egypt. That's a fact. After 2011, the United States policy began to shift and it's been a policy torn by different interests, counterterrorism, stability, yet also a genuine desire, particularly on the part of President Obama, but others around him, to try to help Egypt become more de a more democratic country. When the Egyptian government struck against several dozen US and also German people working in Egypt uh, to promote civil society and greater political space in 2011 and 12, and the, what became the famous prosecutions, I wouldn't say that was, you know, encouraged by the U.S. government. These were people, you know, being funded by the U.S. government. And the Egyptian government was striking against them, and it was a shock to the U.S. government to have people, you know, funded by U.S. assistance programs being put on trial by the Egyptian government. Now, they're <coughs> shocked for the German government as well. And so, yes, U.S. <coughs> policy continues to have a divided heart. And there are parts of the U.S. policy establishment that have a deep relationship with the Egyptian security establishment and want to continue a certain kind of relationship. But I think on balance, the U.S. is at least struggling with the fact that, that Egypt's closing space is not in the interests of either Egypt itself or of a broader U.S. vision of a pluralistic and inclusive Arab world. So I, I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate it. And U.S. policy has been, I'd say, very troubled in the past. It's gotten somewhat better, still divided. But I don't think... The Egyptian government's project is the Egyptian government's project, unfortunately. It's something that this particular government wants to do, and they do look for signals from other actors when they meet with them, but it's their project, unfortunately. Um, with respect to you know, concrete initiatives or ways to, um, to move forward, uh, like I say, that's, I can't uh, encapsulate everything we're supposed to talk about in the next two days. I'm sort of got Turkey on my mind because I've been involved in some meetings there in the last few days. And so it's an example of where suddenly the U.S. security establishment, <clears throat> I just mentioned again, coming from the Washington perspective, the U.S. and the EU, you know, have a deep security relationship with the, with the Turkish government. You know, it's a member of NATO. It's helping out in Syria. It's supposed to be helping out in Iraq in various ways. But what's happening politically in Turkey um, and the persecution of civil society in Turkey is part of a project of this government is xenophobic anti-foreign, sort of nationalistic, demonization, political project that is concretely damaging that security relationship. So it's a moment, very vividly, 
um, if the Department of Defense has a meeting now to talk about what has happened to the Turkish Air Force, if people can be as part of that conversation and say, you know what, um, you're the ones that have some influence because of your interlocutors, and if you can have those conversations also and say, you know, this persecution you're doing is actually not just damaging the military, it's damaging a much broader interest in cooperation between these societies based on shared values that we have. So we have to seize opportunities that come from particular political junctures, I think, like in Ethiopia right now, to go and say, look, suddenly you're facing a kind of instability. We think we understand parts of the roots of that, which you've denied over the last five to 10 years. You've excluded people who've had other voices. We're concerned about that. We'd like to be a partner in your future, but look at what's happening to you, and we'd like to be part of that conversation. So you have to sort of seize the junctures, mobilize with arguments, get new partners together, and, and push both in the Western policy space and also in the space in those countries. Thank you very much. You are so good on time. Thank you very much, Thomas. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry we couldn't take all the questions. And I'm sure we could go on for two hours and there wouldn't be a, an end to the questions. Thanks very much for providing a lot of substantive fundament for the conversations uh, today and tomorrow and on Friday and challenging us in, in terms of our thinking. And I'm sure that a lot of this will be picked up again and again uh, during the conference and probably also during the panel discussion or the coffee table discussion, we called it, that we will have right now. And I'd like to ask three people to come and join me on the podium. Dita Katurani from Indonesia, Bahe El Din Hassan from Egypt, that was talked about a lot already, and Hendi Tifania from India. So if you would come up to join me. Um, and I think we have your name tags here. I thought, Dita, you might want to be here. And Henry, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Encouragement and appreciation is well expressed and applauding. Hello, Mahe. Hello. Hi. If you would want to take this one, yeah. And Henry would take this one. Now, we have a coffee table discussion about how we experience drinking space. So obviously, we would want to look at from the global analysis and uh, the analysis of the complex causes to real life experiences and your analysis of what is going on in your countries and how it relates to what's going on in other countries. Let me introduce you properly. We have Dita Katurani, a frontline feminist activist from Indonesia, focusing on the intersectional aspects of women's and LGBT, LGBTIQ's rights, human rights and democracy and technology. And I would love you guys to come up with a different acronym. Um, welcome to Bahe Eldin Hassan, the director of the Cairo Institute for Human Rights Studies. Uh, not living in your country right now, but in Paris, and as I was told earlier, a father figure to very many in the Arab region. And we have Henry Tifanje, executive director of People's Watch India, and also a laureate of the Amnesty International German Human Rights Award. I would like to start with you, Dita and uh, ask you to briefly describe the situation of shrinking spaces in Indonesia, and in particular what it means for you as a frontline feminist activist. Okay, um, thank you everyone, and um, actually thank you for the organizer for having me here. Um, English is not my language, so bear with me. Um, and the situation in Indonesia, I think it's not unique, and I, I don't think it's the worst. Uh, there's a lot of same thing going on in all Southeast Asia, the same situations. But it's not only Southeast Asia, but it's also all over the world, especially, for example, in MENA regions. Um, I've seen news that is actually the situation is worse there. But I would like to um, tell you a little bit about um, what's going on in Indonesia. There are three keywords right now in Indonesia if we are talking about the shrinking spaces. One is um, um, LGBT. The second one is communist, and the third one is separatism. These are these three issues that the government are using to do a crackdown um, and you know, attack and arrest in Indonesia. As an activist, um, all of us in Indonesia, we, were, we, we feel like right now, um, we feel like we are thrown back to the year where we have the dictator Suharto for 32 years, where there's a lot of you know there's there's no space for us to speak up, there's no spe uh, space for us to um, express ourselves. 
But what what is ironic is that it happens right now, in the last two years where we have what we call the popular president, the people's president Jokowi, that was elected two years ago. There has been a lot of more crackdowns, more arrest, uh, more cancellations of public events like discussion, public discussions, festivals, um, and and meetings of human rights issues, um, you know, farmers uh, or peasants meetings, LGBT meetings, women's meetings, um, everywhere in the country. We recorded, this is only what we can record because the, the media uh, reported it, or if they, our friends from other places reported to us, there has been 56 cancellation prohibitions, um, dispersal of public events happened in 2016 alone. And all of them, most of them um, with the use of intimidations, threats, and violence. There have been a lot of arrests, especially West Papua. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the issues of West Papua. But since February this year, there are more than 4,000 people arrested in protests when, when they were doing protests on the street. Of course, a lot of them were released uh, within a day or two, but some of them um, have legal cases uh, going on in court right now. But it sends a message, you know, it sends a message. Even if they are uh, released within a day or two, it sends a message that, you know, if you do this, this is what's going to happen to you, right? There's also, um, Worse than that, there's also murder. Last year, Salim Kanchil, for example, exactly September 2015, so um, he's a farmer, uh, became a leader of um, and organizers of the local farmers um, to protest against the mining company, sand mining company. He was beaten up to death last year. And um, we are not still sure, but I just want to tell you, just two days ago, a young lawyer, 24 years old, our friend, he's been assi assisting um, the peasants in, in Kendeng area in West Java, um, who was fighting against the cement factory. He was also killed um, in, in traffic accident. We are not still yet that this is... Um, a pure accident or not, but we are looking into that. Because it happened right on the day that he should be going to Jakarta to go to a Supreme Court to get the verdict documents from the Supreme Court on the case of the people, the person uh, against the cement factory. So this is what has been going on in, 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 in Indonesia right now. And the, the recent development is that there have uh, the government are working working on on two laws. Yeah, one is this actually judicial refer, review in the constitutional court submitted by a a, a couple of conservative religious based um, organizations. They they request to change our penal code to criminalize LGBT. So when this law is passed, if if the constitutional court. Uh, agree with the, with the request, then being LGBT will send someone to jail for five, up to five years. On the sa at the same time, the parliament also is working on the law that will criminalize anyone who is accused to be a communist or spreading the ideas of communism up to 12 years in prison. By communist, it could be anyone, anyone who has voice of dissent against the government. Mm -hmm. So we are facing this. It could happen in just a few months, a couple months, three months from now. So we are still waiting. I have a friend from Indonesia here, colleagues. Uh, Haris Asar is also here. He can also tell us a lot about it. So there, um, I also want to pick up something that Barbara said earlier this morning about the online spaces. While a lot of people think, when the, the offline spaces is being shrinking, we, have, we still have an alternative space, which is the online space. But it, that is not true. The online space now become the medium for the government to carry out surveillance, censorship, and even arrest. We have a cyber law in Indonesia. Um, it, since it was enact, enacted in 2008, there has been 170 people being criminalized using this law. The, last, the latest one is today. The latest one is today. So it's if if we want to talk about the shrinking spaces, that that's now 
that is the reality on the ground in Indonesia, and I know that it's also happening everywhere. But before I, I um, end my um, talk here, I just want to also pose a question for all of us. When we talk about civic space, what we mean with civic space? We, need, we really need to come to an agreement what is the civic, civic space is. Because a lot of groups there who are carrying out the attacks against the civil society, us as activists, pro-democracy activists, they are also civil society. If we want the if we want the government to you know like um, arrest them for whatever they're doing, they can also claim that we are a civil society and we have the right to speak up and do the things that we want to do. So I think it, it is the questions that I want to pose mm -hmm. to all of us here. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dita, um, for the experience, but also coming back with a question right away. But I want to turn to you because uh, obviously Egypt has been a topic uh, already, and I actually. I read your recent statement to the UN Human Rights Council uh, in September, and one sentence that struck me here was, if this council says, stay silent, you said, in face of Egyptian government's escalation, it should expect that other governments across the world may follow suit. So how do you assess the role of international community? How do you see the relationship between what's happening in Egypt, and if we don't react, what might happen elsewhere? Do you want to share about that? Mm -hmm. um, I would like to make a, a link between the excellent uh, presentation made by Tom just a few minutes ago and your questions. Uh, Tom at the beginning said that just in two years the question has been uh, was moved from shrinking the public space to closing the public space. If I have only one explanation, I would say this is because the international community has rewarded such shift, indirectly has rewarded. It was almost silent. Just blah, 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 some statements here and there, but no uh, proportional actions on the ground. In fact, if we move to Egypt, it is not just closing the public space. This, there is a, a, a plan to eradicate the human rights community. There is a prosecution of dozens of human rights NGOs. If this is, would be moved to the court, which he expected soon, this means that in, the trial, in this trial, hundreds of human rights Egyptian human rights defenders would be in uh, this trial. You referred, when you <coughs> introduced me, you said that uh, I am now uh, based in Paris. I have to. I received the death threat just two weeks after CC uh, has assumed uh, his office. Uh, later on, after uh, uh, almost one year from receiving this death threat, several defenders and the liberal and secular uh, activists received the same uh, threat. Now, unfortunately, we can say that there are tens of human rights defenders, liberal and secular activists, journalists, artists, Egyptians, are not have, have to leave Egypt. More are coming, uh, are ha uh, have to leave soon. <coughs> uh, uh, back to your question concerning the um, uh, response of the international community, I would just address Egypt as example of why such trend, which Tom uh, addressed, uh, why it is deepening more and more. There is no serious response. In fact, of course, on the ground, there are defenders in every country. They are resisting, they are ready to pay the price, whatever, to be killed, to, be, to go to, to prison. Uh, even some of the defenders, 
now in Egypt, when they offered to move to exile because they, according to a recent amendment made by President Sisi, uh, it allows him to, to send human rights defenders in, uh, to prison 25 years just be, because, be, because advocating human rights. Of course, the charge formally would not be human rights because the amendment which he made, it is related to counter-terrorism. Mm -hmm. This is how the, the, the political game is, uh, is played in Egypt. In this regard, uh, it is uh, ironic to watch that the same states which are charged that they fund Egyptian, those human rights defenders, to serve the interest of those foreign countries, the same uh, foreign countries, like Germany, like UK, like France, they not only invite President Sisi to, 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 to capitals, but they also export to him equipments for more and more repression and the crackdown. So in this context, it is in fact green lighting, the crackdown against the human rights, not only silence. It is not just silence. Mm -hmm. In this context, and this is my last uh, comment, I would uh, refer to a shocking statement came from John Kerry, the Secretary of State, 21st of July this year. This statement, it came between two sessions of, the, of uh, a court for human rights defenders. I am one of those defenders in this, uh, in this uh, court session. And John Kerry said, in, uh, in his statement, he celebrates Egyptian government commitment to, to full democratic process. If this is not a green lighting of the crackdown mm -hmm. and the prosecuting human rights defender, it is just not a ironic lie. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. it is green light. Just a few weeks after this statement, the court made its ruling and decided to freeze the assets of three human rights NGOs, mm -hmm. including the Cairo Institute, my organization, and the five individual human rights defenders, including myself. So thank you, Ms. Sarkey. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, similarly to the Egyptian government using counter-terrorism laws uh, for oppression, I think uh, even maybe not to the same extent, uh, but in India, the government has been using laws against uh, f external financial flows to crack down uh, on organizations or freeze accounts or terminate uh, programs that you were working on. Henry, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in India? Well, um, thank you for having us here. Um, I was um, expecting the keynote address to go through the list of countries in a little more genuine manner. I wondered why you stopped with Turkey and Egypt and Ethiopia and in that list missed off perhaps India. Unfortunately, I'm here to place India and several other countries like India, which to the Western world still continues to be a large democracy, uh, placing it in the light of the same um, countries that we have seen here and almost the same situation that we are seeing here. While we are sitting here, we have uh, a colleague of ours from Kashmir who was traveling to Geneva to attend the last Human Rights Council meeting on the 20th of um, on the 14th of uh, September, and who was stopped in the Delhi airport, packed back, arrested. Initially, the district court ensured that he was, he was released, saying there was no basis, and then the Public Security Act has been taken. He's for 40 days in prison, 
about 300 kilometers away from, from his home. And the case has been adjourned just four days ago or five days ago uh, till, till mid-November to attend the Human Rights Council meeting in Geneva. Nothing more. His colleagues were allowed, not he. You have yesterday the security forces in Chhattisgarh protesting on the streets after announcing and taking the effigies of petitioners before the Supreme Court of India, taking uh, the, the effigies of, of women human rights defenders who have been, who have been before courts, who have been before, before, before tribunals, etc., revealing what has happened. Now, all this after the Supreme Court three days ago uh, categorically had harsh words against the Chhattisgarh government and, and police forces there. Police forces burning effigies of, of activists, human rights defenders, petitioners before the Supreme Court of India. Three days ago. I mean, this was, this was yesterday. This was yesterday afternoon. You can, you can go on. You have a former special rapporteur of the, of the United Nations on health, Anand Grover. You're a former member of the CEDAW committee, his wife, in fact, Indra Jay Singh. Both of them running an organization called Lawyers Collective in India who have their Foreign Contribution Regulation Act uh, registration challenged. You have a host of 10,000 organizations who have lost it. I myself have lost it for 540 long days of three periods of suspension. I had a case right today, heard minutes before I came here, uh, and, it, and I was told that our five-year five registration, which is going to be over on the 31st of October, and 18,000 organizations do not have their registration. I was told that an IB report is pending against me, and I would know definitely online before the 31st of October. Okay, we have access to, 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 to go to court. There are thousands of organizations who don't have access to go to court, and that is the state in which we are. The, the, the mechanism of the shrinking space is not only shrinking your bank accounts and, 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 and ensuring that your functioning gets off. It is that the rule of law which is expected in a democracy like India is by itself completely crumbled. Mm -hmm. So you will see that the normal rule of law, the normal procedures in a criminal justice administration system is, is, is off for everybody and therefore for the human rights defender. And the best way you crumple a human rights defender is to ensure that you, you pose a number of criminal cases against them, ensuring that their entire movement is crippled. And you have to be in such situations, you have to face such situations to know what we are talking about. If, if I have three cases against me, I know how I get paralyzed. But imagine people with 30 cases, 300 cases, 400 cases, 2,500 cases against them, and, and they have to go to the Supreme Court to get cases withdrawn. This is the mechanism that is used in a democracy because everything is fair in a democracy. The judiciary is supposed to be. And I, I, want, to, I want to raise this question of, of these politicians and this transformative politics that was presented. It is not only the politicians. It is in countries like ours, you find that the judiciary is part of the conspiracy on many occasions. And I say it with a, with a great pain because I'm talking about my own judiciary. And I don't talk only about the judiciary in a country like India. I, I need also to say that national and state human rights institutions, which are huge, huge institutions in our country. It is not like the, like the German Institute of Human Rights here, one. We are 169 such institutions. All of them are part of this conspiracy. So let us, not, let us not just put it across and say it is only something to do with politicians. It is also other institutions that of, of, of democracy that have to perform, which are refusing to perform, are, are performing in conspiracy with them. Mm -hmm. I think we will, we will take the conversation mm -hmm. further. Yeah. Thank you very much, Henry. It reminds me, um, Dita, of, of something that you also wanted to talk about, and that is to ask who are the actors in shrinking civic space. You just asked who are civil society organizations, what is civic space? And maybe you would also respond to Henry and his analysis. Um, yeah, Be because in, in Indonesia, it's, uh, right now it's very unique and different. Compared to what happened to us during the, dictac the dictator um, regime, which uh, finally ended in 1998 after Suharto being toppled down by the people, right? Um, Back then, we have, it's clearly, the enemy is the state, it's the government and it's, it's apparatus, right? The military, the police. 
But now it's completely different. The main actor, although we know it is still the state, but the one on the ground in the field is that vigilante groups. Mm -hmm. You know, those groups who use the name of God and religion to attack us. So right now, of course, they're always being backed up by the government, by the, the government apparatus, by the police, by the military. In, for example, in the if, uh, public events that we have, the first groups that will come are those people, and then the police will come, or the police will come first and then said, you know, to to ask the organizer, you know, you need to cancel the event because this group, this group, threatened to come and attack you. So we would say, you know, you're the cops, you're the police, you should um, you, you should protect us, and they said, no, we cannot protect you. In a lot of cases, even the police um, forced us to cancel or even evacuated us, but not arresting those people. So these people, the, this vigilante group, call themselves self civil society as well. You know, who said, you know, we don't agree with LGBT, uh, we don't agree with communism, and these people are LGBT communism and blah 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 blah, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's 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 the thing, yeah. Um, and then this. So of course, so we have the state, we have these vigilante groups, and then this we also need to look at ourselves as a civil society, <laughs> be it activists or just a common people, you know, non-activists. With all of these bad things that is going on in, for example, in my country, people started to become a gatekeeper for ourselves. Not to say this thing, not to say that thing. Just shut up. Don't protest the government. Otherwise, you will get arrested. Otherwise, you will get attacked. You know, because they are not now not just afraid of the government, but they are also afraid of these groups, the vigilante groups, and and not just being the gatekeeper of ourselves, but also being the gatekeeper of others. You know, don't say that. Don't see. Don't say this. You know, then that that is the dangerous mm -hmm. although it although to me the civil society is not the direct actor that contribute to the shrinking spaces but we are contributing to some extent by being a gatekeeper of our, ourselves and that is I think self-censorship it's the most dangerous kind of censorship mm -hmm. and it will not do the country any good you know when the people stay silent becoming silent then there are there will be more atrocities carried out by the government yeah. and even all of those groups. Mm -hmm. I think that's. But it's also what is very important to mention is the role of corporations. They are the big actors. Why the government do what they are doing is of course to guard the interests of the corporations. The government, for example, in Indonesia, openly the government always say, you know, this is to to keep the, um, what you call that, the investment, uh, in, so that the inf is investment can be stable in Indonesia, uh, foreign investors are not afraid to come in. So this is what we need to do. So big corporations is really um, um, play a major role in shrinking spaces in, in the civil society. And there, there has been a lot of, um, um, what you call that, a, a lot of um, examples. I'm here in, in Germany, one of the big corporations that is now we are fighting against is the cement factory by Heidelberg. Yeah, it, Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. it's, a German, it's a German company, mm -hmm. the cement factory that we are now fighting against. And that is just one example. Um, so mm -hmm. I think... Mm -hmm. I think that. But I, I also want to talk about donors as, as well as a contributing <laughs> factor of, of shrinking spaces, but I think we can come to that later. Okay. Okay, I would want to turn to Baha'i exactly for this, because you also said you wanted to talk about the role of the donor community. So the question that is emerging for me is, who is the enemy, who is uh, our family, and who is uh, uh, working against civic space and the liberties that we're passionate about? Um, do you want to comment on the role of, a, of the donor community in this? I can say that the, uh, there is uh, one stand or uh, one response 
Uh, I see a mix of responses. Uh, as Kion Institute, I am, uh, I, I am sure that we were lucky. Uh, I mean, in having donors who um, listen, uh, they accepted three years ago, they agreed with us on our political analysis of how the situation in Egypt would be evolved. So, and three years ago, we adopted our plan B because after having a general who oversaw the lar largest bloody massacre in modern Egypt history, having him a president, no illusion what would be uh, the situation of not only civil society, but also political community as well. And of course, at the top human rights defender. So we had this plan B almost three years ago. Our donors uh, uh, understood well, and they ready when we decide to implement it. So we implement plan B two years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, so, but unfortunately, this is not the case with other Egyptian NGOs or in some other Arab countries as far as I observe, as Cairo Institute has a regional geographic mandate for the uh, Arab region. Uh, therefore, I am sorry to say that the attitude and the concept of some donors indirectly contribute to the same response which I explained mm -hmm. in my first comment. I mean indirectly rewarding and the encouraging crackdown on civil society. By making some donors, first of all, not listen enough to NGOs on the ground, not listen to their analysis, their expectation. Uh, uh, and this is, of course, in a moment, the donors find themselves in a very difficult situation, as it was explained by David uh, uh, this morning. Uh, but I am sure that for some donors, if they listen carefully to NGOs they support, they would be ready in advance to respond uh, proactively to, to what is going on. Uh, second, there is the concept which uh, uh, doesn't appreciate the core funding for NGOs, which makes NGOs all the time uh, you know, struggling just to survive. Or uh, important part of its energy, it goes to uh, this direction. There are also some donors which, in spite that all the time they saying that they believe how much civil and political rights are complementary to economic and social rights, but on the ground, they <laughs> go in the other direction. And they think that by supporting economic and social rights, this is what gives them opportunity to uh, operate in this or that country, mm. which also not the case. For instance, the court ruling just last month of uh, freezing the assets mm. of the NGOs, one of them working its mandate. It is the right for education. Nothing political, nothing related to civil rights. So even not all economic and social rights. Also, some donors, uh, and maybe also this is related to, the, to Tom's presentation, uh, they don't realize that whatever we like it or not, even the human rights defenders themselves, they find themselves on the front line, not only in defending human rights, 
in acting as actors for modern, modernization, mm -hmm. not only in, the, in Egypt, in the Arab region. In fact, human rights defenders in the Arab region not only struggling for political civil rights, economic and civil rights, and, and so on, but they also struggling for enlightenment of their people. They are also active actors against extreme religious discourses and against radicalization. So even in some cases, human rights defenders unconsciously find themselves that they are treated by their governments as political actors, but they are not. Mm -hmm. But this is the political context of this country or, uh, or this region. So, uh, therefore, I said at the beginning of uh, my response to your question that concerning the donors, it is mixed. Thank you. Mixed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Henry, I w I'm wondering if you'd like to respond to this as well and also pick up the issue of investment and investors and uh, protecting that. Yeah, I, I, I thought I'll just continue from where I left. I, I, I involved, engaged with the judiciary, but I think it's important also to say that um, in, in, in democracies which, which um, experience this phenomenon of shrinking space, uh, they also co-opt the media into it. And therefore, large-scale media in countries like India are, are no longer with, with, with civil society. We have lost the media completely. Uh, and we talk today more about alternative media. We talk more about online media today because the, the regular media is, is completely sold. That's number one. Number two, this whole uh, elections becomes a big farce. This whole exercise of elections and exercise of elections being our expression of how our democracy functions ultimately becomes a big farce in this, in this transformative, transformative politics that was, that was referred in the, in the keynote address. So it is not only the judiciary, we have, we have, we have lost the media, we have lost this whole process of elections as well. And therefore, this democracy therefore survives in terms of, of, of shrinking the space using vigilantes. And it is not in Indonesia, it is also in India. And for, for those of you who, who know this phenomenon of the attack on Amnesty International in India, in Bangalore, when they were, they were having a small discussion, which was, which was a very normal discussion with victims from Kashmir, whom they wanted to, 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 to take around the country, for people around the country to know what is happening in Kashmir. It was just that. It was nothing more than that that Amnesty India had planned. And th there was an attack. And the end of the attack was through by these vigilantes. And the end of the attack was, an, was a case of sedition against Amnesty International. So the one who organized the meeting in the most peaceful manner was the one who's, who's now going to be behind bars. Of course, because it was not a, not a, a BJP government, it was a Congress government there. Uh, there was a process by which the, the case was closed after the investigation. But the, the vigilante culture is not only in, Indi in Indonesia. Wherever you have democracy, it is this democracy which is used to be able to get different sections to, to, to put pressure on that aspect of civil society which, which, which promotes and works for human rights. The, uh, the, um, the other thing in terms of donors, I think it is important to mention that uh, donors are also under attack. I come from, from a country where donors are under attack. We've had Ford Foundation, which is just limping back to normalcy. They perhaps may not even like me talking about them in public uh, because there were a lot of behind the scenes uh, um, moves that have, that have restored back. OSI um, prefers not to talk about anything to do with India for some time so that something can be restored. Uh, everybody is in difficulties. Greenpeace is, 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 is off India in terms of its, its uh, resources. Lots of donors are out. I am lucky I'm speaking in Berlin because we are in good company with, with Germany. At least uh, Modi is in good company with Germany for the moment. And therefore, uh, German donors don't have any, any threat. But other, other European donors are having major threats in, in their investments in India uh, because of the type of work they were supporting and the type of investments they were questioning. The other question I think which, which needs to be also is that there is a sign of hope also. Civil society is creative. Civil society is not only at the receiving end and civil society wants to give back. And one, one, one emerging process that, that has happened in India which I think could go on on that list is the, the formation of a People's Commission uh, for uh, shrinking democratic space. 
People's Commission of a variety of organizations across the country who have constituted the People's Commission. And the People's Commission having now mandated a People's Tribunal, which will start hearing these cases because you can't take these cases to the judiciary and always get success. But we need to continue to, to keep this, this, this flame alive. And the only manner in which you can keep this flame alive in a democracy is to ensure that you have a People's Commission which, which creates a People's Tribunal, which takes up these issues and then starts moving it forward. And I think these are the, the type of things that we also demand from, from, an, from a body which is as international as yours. Is it not time for such, such international solidarity? Mm -hmm. Because um, what, what do I gain as a grassroots activist by coming to such fora if we don't take back the international solidarity that, that all of you are able to offer and we are able to offer in turn to, to our colleagues in different countries. I think, therefore, the creativity is there, which is, which, is, which, is, which is within our borders, but I think we need some international creativity, and the first aspect of that creativity is definitely solidarity. Mm -hmm. Without that international solidarity, such meetings don't have relevance for many of us in our, in our, in our own uh, milieu of work. If you could just keep the microphone, um, I'd like to give you all one question as a, as a last round, and that's what needs to happen next. And you were just saying international solidarity. Can you give us one or two thoughts on what this concretely might mean taking away from here? Well, um, before getting into what it means, uh, the question is if we don't do that, we are going to see a violent world. A country like India, where, where this shrinking space phenomenon continues, um, is, is costing us great. We are into our third UPR at the moment. And I know the number of activities that took place in the UPR too, and the lesser number of activities that took place towards UPR 3. Let's be very honest about it. On the 21st of this, 22nd of this month, the Indian NHRC is going through its uh, subcommittee on accreditation of the, of the Global Alliance for National Human Rights Institutions. I don't know what is going to happen. If we open our mouth, perhaps I will have another 180 days of suspension if I ever get my FCRA back. This is the cost I had to pay precisely because of speaking last time. So within the country, you are going to see that all channels are closed and therefore more violent forms of protest are going to take place only because such space was shrunk. Globally, participation in global fora are going to reduce. People might be present, people will not speak, people will hesitate to speak because there is a huge price that one has to pay and it is much better to continue your work without speaking outside than to come outside and speak because it's of no value. And therefore, this solidarity has, has not to be this artificial solidarity. This solidarity has to be a violent solidarity, a solidarity which is, which is, which is expressive, a solidarity which speaks and a solidarity which expresses when people most need it. When organizations are under attack, we need the solidarity to take different forms and ensure that they are present and that they are speaking and that they are on the side of those who are under attack. Those who are under attack are people who have already decided that we will continue in spite of our attack. Mm -hmm. But what we expect is people like, people like us globally don't lecture at that time and people like us globally are able to act. So we need an action-oriented solidarity to, 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 to borrow my good friend Adil's term of persecuted organizations. It is no longer individuals. Organizations are persecuted. Mm -hmm. And organizations which are persecuted need many of you to speak when you have to speak. Don't send urgent appeals and all that doesn't work. Speak loud, speak clearly, but definitely speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry. Just pass it on, or, or Dieter. Um, what, what, do you, what is, in your view, what is it that needs to happen this year next? Yeah, I think, I think it's uh, similar to what um, he said already. You know, international solidarity is very important, but it should be really... Um, um, concrete. I just want to give you an example. We, I, I was mentioning about we are fighting against this Heidelberg um, um, company, Cement. right? Mm -hmm. German. Well, w when we talk to HBS about it and some p some other people, our friends in, in Germany, there has been a huge protest in Germany against uh, Heidelberg. Yeah. And people in the, uh, uh, you know, politicians that the HBS know, uh, are starting to pick it up also in the parliament. They were talking, you know, also people are signing petitions. I think that is very important. I remember also the case in Uganda where, where a few years back when the government of Uganda was going to impose a law that will criminalize um, LGBT. There's an international outcry, huge international outcry. And finally the laws 
was struck down. Right, that's the kind of thing that we really need. Um, but it also, uh, I hope that that's in the international level, but the national level also, there should be, you know, organizing ourselves between civil society, um, non-activists, activists, NGO, and everything. Yeah, it's not easy. I know. Yeah, there's politics too. There's politics between civil so society. Yeah, we we have to admit it. You know, um, the money is shrinking from the donors, and there's a lot of NGO. Uh, we have to admit that people are or NGO are fighting for that piece of cakes that is shrinking now. So I think that is also that we have to put aside all of this politics, sit together, you know, keep having conversation, discussions, and and you know having um you know like um like a unification of all the civil society groups, organizations, and individuals. And in Indonesia, we quite. Successful right now. Um, in April, we um, founded um, um, national coalitions, which we call Voice of Democracy. Within two weeks, seven more than seventy organizations joined the coalitions, and we've been working really hard without any donors. Um, it's all you know, every organizations and individuals who come and join the the uh, coalition just chip in money every month. To, to fund our our activities, and also um, speaking again in terms of international solidarity, I know a lot of you work with governments, so that is very important. Give pressure to you to your government that your government can give pressure to our governments, because there's no government in the world can survive by itself. So that is very important. And also, I know a, a lot of you work with um, corporation, with companies on ethical business. You need also to pressure this, um, this corporation. I know this, that's easier said than done, but we need to do it. We need to do it really to pressure those corporations, those companies to ensure that they do ethical business in each country that they uh, operate. And also donors here. I know that's a lot of donors. Please, um, if you want to do programs in country, really see what they need. Do not come up and or some uh, make an assumption that this is the need of this each country. So they, because what happened is that all NGOs, all groups in each country, they don't work on what the actually what people need in that country, but we work on what you throw out out there. You know, like because oh. This donor wants us to work on these issues. Okay, well, we don't need that issue, but we need the money. So we just make up any programs, projects. Let's just admit it, it happens everywhere. So be flexible on issues. If you really want to help us fighting against these shrinking spaces, that's what you need to do. And also, I know that I, I know where you're coming from as donors. You want accountability, you want transparency, but there should be, we sh you should come up with mechanism that will allow flexibility, that will allow people in the field, on the ground, to work on what they need, but it still ensure that there is transpar transparency and accountability. That's what I want to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye. Uh, before responding to your question, just as I was uh, missing info, when I said that our donors were very understandable uh, and they accepted our plan P, which was mainly to open, another, to move mm -hmm. most of our staff to Tunisia and open an office working on the region and they give and they um, leave just a small office uh, in Cairo. Um, uh, I would like to join my colleagues concerning their call for international solidarity and the better understanding. Uh, but I would like to add that um, in the context of what I uh, addressed in my two comments, I think Egypt is very valid as a case study for the main question of this session. I mean, how um, the situation moved from shrinking the uh, public space to closing to 
elimination or eradication of the human rights community. What is the, how the international community respond to such evolving situation? In spite, and the Tom is my witness here, in spite that human rights NGOs in Egypt three years ago in a meeting in Brussels with participation of some Egyptian uh, NGOs, some donors, some uh, other actors from international community, and this is was organized by the Cairo Institute, we said that Egypt is moving in this direction three years ago. But this is the response which I explained why this happened. This is, I think, it, it needs to be addressed to better understand, to conclude lessons. May it would be valid for uh, other countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let us, let us thank our three contributors on this panel. Thank you very much uh, for your analysis and sharing your experiences, but also sharing challenges and challenging us all. We do have a coffee break right now. I would like to invite you uh, to check if you are up on the networking wall. Uh, if not, have your picture taken and put yourselves there. Coffee is being served, I believe, in the foyer as well as in the cafeteria downstairs. If there's anything else that you need, please see people at the registration desk and be back here by 4.30. Thank you very much. <laughs>